name is Walter Merida, and I am the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Applied Science. It doesn't seem to, oh, there we go. And like uh, many of us here, I'm very lucky to work, live, and play in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Muscan people. And it is really a pleasure to welcome you to our campus. Uh, I want to start with a few teasers just to kind of some numbers that I just randomly collected from the web last night. And the, the first one is 50%. So in 2015, we crossed the threshold where more than 50% of the global population is now living in urban in cities, in urban centers. And providing services for that new global reality is going to be a challenge independently of climate change. The next number is 10,000. And that's the number of kilograms of minerals that are needed per megawatt of onshore power generated. And that's not a small number. And problematically, a lot of the minerals that are required are centralized in a few regions of the world. 80% of the platinum is produced in South Africa. Most of the cobalt we use for our devices is produced under very, um, I would say problematic working conditions in Congo. The next number is 29.3, and that is the number of terawatt hours per year that our new AI image producing, video producing services are going to require. And just that to give you a sense of what that means, that's the same amount of electricity that Ireland consumes. The next number is 17.6, uh, and that's the number of trillions of dollars in containerized trade that flow around the world. We are now a global economy. And the last one is the most fun one, I think. Has anyone seen these videos of the mammoths, the AI generated videos? I wish it, I was going to show it to you, but I don't want to spend too much time on them. Basically four is the number of lines of code or text, it's not even code, it's just a request. Please make me a video with mammoths in the snow and out comes a 10 second video that you cannot distinguish from the videos produced by the movie industry. The impact of that on labor and the future of work is going to be significant quite separately from our uh, energy demands. And the impact on democracy with this new augmented and artificial intelligence reality that we have is also not insignificant. So, uh, it's quite sobering, I think, to think that almost 10 years ago, everyone was talking about the Paris Accord and what a great political breakthrough that was. In my mind, yes, it was a great political breakthrough, but three other things happened at that meeting in Paris that in my opinion were actually more impactful in the short term. The first, was Bill Gates and some of his billionaire friends created uh, the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, which started channeling billions of dollars to climate technology solutions. The second one was governments didn't want to be embarrassed by this new initiative, so they created Mission Innovation, which is also supposed to be channeling billions of dollars into climate solutions. And the third one, which I think is very important in terms of the international collaboration that is required, and Martin and I were just talking about the financial aspects of climate solutions, is Mark Carney, who, as you may know, uh, used to run the Bank of Canada. We then, he then went on loan to the UK to run their bank. And at the Paris meeting, he created this task force on climate exposure to climate risk. And he created this task force led by Michael Bloomberg, and that started what has now become legislation in the UK and other parts of the world, where now corporations have to disclose their exposure to climate risk. And for the first time, we will have a set of numbers, metrics that will enable us to judge stocks and investment portfolios. And as you have seen, since this was started, our own university is under tremendous pressure to divest from fossil assets. Now, that's a challenge, but on the other hand, large institutional investors have all of a sudden realized that there is a very happy coincidence because climate solutions usually require large quantities of capital. 
and the sovereign wealth funds and the pension funds are starting to look at climate as a potential area for investment. Having said all that, we don't have time. And this is why it's a bit frustrating for me to realize that it is almost 10 years since this was uh, started because the innovation mechanisms are too slow. And tomorrow, I hope to show you a couple of things that UBC is doing to accelerate the innovation mechanisms that are available to us. Now, this sounds very challenging, but I am an optimist. And I'm convinced that we are, we are going to figure a way out of this. And I really hope that in the grand arc of human history, the fossil era will be a glitch in our otherwise continued <laughs> success as a species. Now back to the barrels. The reason that we measure oil by the barrel is that when oil was first drilled in Eastern Pennsylvania, the stuff started gushing out of the ground. And very soon people ran out of containers to store the oil. So whiskey barrels were used to start storing the oil and the barrels quickly became a lot more expensive than the oil they contained. And I use that as a metaphor because as we deploy these new technologies, very interesting new business cases emerge that enable us, I think, to at the same time address the climate challenge, but also create a very prosperous, sustainable future as a global economy. And with that, I, I would love to welcome um, Amanda to get us to, through the rest of the morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, bonjour tout le monde. This is a really pivotal moment. The New Carbon Economy Consortium was created in 2017 and brings together universities, national labs, but now a growing group of financiers, innovators, early stage companies, and policymakers. So Walter, you made some wonderful points about the importance of both climate finance and legislation. This year, something really big happened. The World Bank's mandate was expanded from poverty alleviation to poverty alleviation on a livable planet. So we now have a focus of the multilateral development banks who are able to finance at scale, particularly in emerging markets, who remind often and rightly so in international negotiations, that they are the least responsible for the climate crisis. And we in the developed world need to take cognizance of that and help them leapfrog. So I'm very excited to be here today with uh, an expanded group here at the University of British Columbia. Huge thanks to Walter and his team at Yasser, Arif, and others for putting everything together for us. We have a really fascinating day today that I will quickly outline before introducing our next two speakers. So you are going to hear from a range of experts. There'll be a focus on blue carbon towards the end of the morning. And then this afternoon, you will also hear about some of the green solutions from forestry. To start, we're going to have the father of direct air capture, Klaus Lochner, who will be kicking us off. And there will be time for questions, both online and from all of you for Klaus. So please feel ready to ask Klaus absolutely anything you would like to know. I am thrilled to be co-chair of the New Carbon Economy Consortium, bringing my policy knowledge and learning from the many brilliant scientists in the room, along with Peter Schlosser, the vice president and vice provost of the ASU Global Futures Laboratory, and with Erin Burns from Carbon 180. Erin is unable to be with us in person today. She's actually on a flight, but we're thrilled to have with us Ugbad Kosar, who is the Director of Environmental Justice and will be presenting in some detail later. But Ubad is going to say a few words 
on behalf of our third co-chair, Erin Burns. Ubad, welcome. Wonderful to have you with us.